The children's illustrator Wanda Gog is probably less forgotten than others, but I'm guessing there are still plenty of viewers who aren't familiar with her work. She was born in 1893 into a large artistic family in New Ulm, Minnesota. Her father died of TB when she was 15, and the family experienced serious financial hardship. But Wanda continued with her studies, and in 1913 she was awarded a scholarship to attend the St. Paul School of Art, followed by another to the Minneapolis School of Art. In 1917, she moved to New York and undertook her first commission for a child's book of folklore by Jean Sherwood Rankin. But she continued to study with yet another scholarship, this time to the Art Students League of New York. So she didn't really get to begin her career until 1919 at the age of 26. Initially, she had only limited success as an illustrator, but as an artist she fared much better, with two successful exhibitions of her paintings, lithographs and woodcuts in 1923 and 1926. In that year she met Ernestine Evans, director of the publishers Coward McCann, who suggested that Gog should write and illustrate a children's book. And in 1928, when she was 35 years old, Millions of Cats was published. Up to this point, children's books were formally laid out with text on one side and the picture on the other. But Gog integrated the handwritten text with the pictures and used the double page spread as her potential canvas. Only the cover was printed in colour, but it was very successful nevertheless and is now generally considered to be the first example of the modern picture book. And several others in a similar mould were published over the next few years. In 1929, she had another success with the equally whimsical story, The Funny Thing. And she followed that up with Snippy and Snappy, her story of two field mice in 1931. And the next in the series was her book Gone is Gone, the story of a man who wanted to do housework, which was published in 1935. And all of these books featured simple line illustrations with a strong folk art element. But although the ABC Bunny in 1936 was also monochrome, she used the more subtle tonal styling found in her lithographs. In the same year, she began publishing her own loose translations of Grimm's fairy tales. These featured colour covers, but black and white page illustrations. In 1938, her version of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was published, but it was overwhelmed by the success of Disney's animated feature film released in the same year. Gog's last authored original work was 1941's Nothing At All, The Tale of an Invisible Dog, and unusually for her, this book featured colour illustrations. Most of the few colour examples of her book work there are were created only a few years ago by Robert Morrow. Sadly, in the early 1940s, Wanda Gogg was diagnosed with cancer, and in 1946, she died at the age of 54. Despite his popularity in the 1920s and 30s, very little is now known about British poster artist Frederick Herrick, even in his own country. He was born in 1887, and he studied at Leicester College of Art, followed by London's Royal College which means he would have graduated around 1900, but I can find no evidence of his work before 1920. By that year, it's known he was employed as the studio head for the respected printing house, the Bynard Press, and this is where his close relationship with the London Underground and later London Transport began. Most of Herrick's work made use of clean lines and solid shapes of colour, and were most commonly created not as paintings, but as separate print areas for each colour. Despite his reputation for Art Deco design-conscious illustration, Herrick resisted being typecast, and there were other posters which were more about the painted quality. Frequently he created unlikely but aesthetically compelling colour combinations, and sometimes veered into positively psychedelic territory, as in this series for the underground, on the theme of the human senses. 
London Transport weren't his only client and he created graphics for others, such as these Royal Mail posters, and the Lion logo used extensively to promote the British Empire exhibition held in Wembley in 1924. And he was one of a small group of illustrators commissioned to design publicity material for the Empire Marketing Board between 1926 and 1933. This series was another excursion into a more unexpected painterly territory. But it was his more graphic work, featuring flat colour and varying degrees of abstraction, which dominated most of his output for the capital's transport system. Nevertheless, there were other occasional stylistic departures, such as his Christmas transport posters in the early 1930s, and a particularly fanciful series for some of London's more esoteric sides. But just as I couldn't find any of Herrick's early work, I've drawn a blank with anything after the mid-30s, and although it's known that he taught intermittently at a number of art schools, the absence of images is particularly odd as he didn't die until 1970 when he was 83. George Petty and his work will more than likely be familiar to fans of pin-up art, but generally he's not that well known. He was born in Louisiana in 1894, and his family moved to Chicago just before the turn of the century. As a teenager, George attended evening classes at Chicago's Academy of Fine Arts, and he also worked part-time in his father's photographic studio, where he learned how to use a compressor-powered airbrush. The airbrush wasn't an easy tool to get the better of, but in the right hands it was capable of creating flawless skin tones and sheer fabrics, and Petty became highly skilled in its use. His father died unexpectedly in 1917, and at the age of 23, George Petty became head of the household. His prowess with the airbrush made him pretty sought after, both as a photo retoucher and an illustrator, for posters, press ads and anything else that came his way. His business and income grew over the next few years, and by the mid-1920s he was successfully running his own studio. Pinups weren't his only commissions, but they were in increasingly high demand for calendars, magazines and advertising. These provocative images of females quickly became known as the Petty Girls, and their popularity was enhanced by their appearance in Esquire magazine from 1933 onwards. Once they had become a permanent fixture of the magazine, Petty began creating humorous situations, and the girls would be accompanied usually by a lecherous old man or a clueless nerd. This device was used to great effect in his ad campaign for Old Gold Cigarettes, which nicely combined humour and eroticism. Petty's girls, and his leading men for that matter, were highly idealised figures, far removed from more naturalistic pin-up artists such as Gil Elvgren. Both featured heavily in his ad campaign for Janssen Swimwear, and they bore a striking resemblance to Joseph Leyendecker's heroic Aryan figures, with small heads and sculpted bodies, similar to modern superheroes and heroines. Petty's work was also linked for quite a few years with the promotion and publicity for the Ice Capades shows, and he created many more family-friendly girls for them between the 40s and the 60s. By the 50s, Petty had acquired celebrity status, and there was even a completely missable Hollywood movie, supposedly based on him and his fictional racy lifestyle. In the late 50s, he began to wind down, supposedly into retirement, but he was still creating pinups up to his death in California in 1975. Fritz Eichenberg was born into a German-Jewish family in Cologne in 1901 and he studied art at Cologne School of Applied Arts and the Academy of Graphic Arts in Leipzig. In 1922, at the age of only 21, he created woodcut illustrations for the German folk tale Till Eulenspiegel. In 1923, he moved to Berlin, and similar commissions followed for books and magazines. But he also made excursions into other media, such as collage, gouache, ink and pencil. By the later 1920s, the anti-Semitism of Hitler's National Socialist Party was making life increasingly difficult for Eichenberg, 
and when they came to power in 1933, he and his family fled Germany on a ship bound for New York. In America, his extensive understanding of creative printmaking led to academic positions at a couple of art schools, which gave him some financial security. In 1937, Eichenberg's heavily graphic but descriptive interpretation of the Uncle Remus stories was published, and this was a radical departure from the ornate penwork of previous editions. In 1939, he illustrated Heroes of the Kalevala, a collection of Nordic tales containing many monochrome illustrations which looked like pen and ink but were actually created with scraper board. Eichenberg quickly developed a reputation for his visualisation of literary works exploring the darker side of the human condition such as Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment which was also published in 1939 and a year later he had considerable success with his darkly comic woodcut interpretation of Swift's Gulliver's Travels. His edition of Tolstoy's epic novel War and Peace was published in 1943 and featured a lighter linear technique. And in the same year his gloomy illustrations for Emily Bronte's Jane Eyre appeared and both received great critical acclaim. 1944 saw the publication of his illustrated collection of stories by Edgar Allan Poe and this book in particular was a masterful demonstration of the creative potential that exists between illustration and the written word. Only a year later he equaled this creative success with a spectacularly dark and brooding edition of Charlotte Bronte's Wuthering Heights. But not all Eichenberg's work was woodcut, and not all of it was serious. This can be seen in his surprisingly light series of pen and watercolour illustrations for Anna Sewell's Black Beauty in 1945, and his monochrome images for the book Mistress Masham's Repose in 1946 clearly demonstrated his facility for humorous narrative illustration. In 1948, Wolf Dorian's novel Kai auf der Kiste was published in Germany and it featured watercolours and line illustrations created by Eichenberg in an overtly comic style. But his most significant and enduring work of the 1950s was created for his two rhyming animal books. The first was Ape in a Cape, which was published in 1952. It's still in print, and as far as I can tell, this book predated Dr. Seuss's Fox in Socks by more than a decade. This was followed by Dancing in the Moon in 1955, which also dealt with numbers, and both these books displayed not only Eichenberg's humour, but his ability to work creatively with limited colour. By the 1960s, Eichenberg's workflow slowed down, but there were still quite a few highlights, including 1972's misanthropic series of images for the satirical book In Praise of Folly, originally written in 1509 by Desiderius Erasmus. And his work in the 1980s showed that his power had not diminished with age. But after a lifetime of prolific creativity, Fritz Eichenberg died at his home in Rhode Island in 1990, aged 89. And that's it for now, so I hope to see you next time. <laughs>